on sharp on time, so I'm going to try to keep the lectures on time. Um, so let's see. Last week we learned two tricks. We learned the trick of conditioning. That is, if you have the probability of one thing happening and you want to know the probability of two things happening, you just multiply probabilities. Marginals times conditionals gives you the joint, and that's the rule of going from the probability of a small thing to a probability of many things. Okay, so the probability that the first ball will be red to the probability of the first two balls being red. So that was conditioning. The other thing that we learned about was marginalization. That is, how do you go from knowing two things, the probability that ball one and ball two uh, take certain values, to just knowing one thing, the probability that just ball two takes a particular value. So from many to one. Um, I then began um, the following exercise. And in this exercise, what I was doing was trying to write everything using uh, a pr a matrices. So in particular, let 0, as I've written here, let 0 denote the red ball, let 1 denote blue ball, and now the variable is x. And so x can take values 0 or 1. So it's a variable that indicates whether you pick the red ball or a blue ball. And recall there were three red balls and one blue ball. So our urn was of the form red, 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 blue. Okay. So three out of four times you will get a red ball and one quarter of the times you get a blue ball, which is essentially what this is saying. Three out of four times you get a blue ball, one quarter you get um, the second ball. And that's the first try. That's what your first ball will be. In other words, what x1 will be. So what you might want to know is what's the probability that the second ball will be red? In other words, that it will be three quarters or that it will be blue, that it will be one quarter. And we had already calculated in the previous slide that the probability of the second ball being um, red was 3 quarters. So we're getting the right probabilities just by doing the matrix multiplication. The only thing we need to remember in doing this, so this just gives us a very quick data structure to do the problems very quickly. So if you know matrices, instead of doing each of these guys one by one, you can just form the matrices. Um, multiply them, but you have to be careful how you multiply them. I'm doing a left multiply here instead of a right multiply. And then we get the probability of the next variable. Sure. Uh, let, let's go back a, a little bit. This is extremely important, so I really want to make sure everyone's on the same page. We have three red balls and a blue ball. And we had the first question I ask is what's the probability that you pick a ball of what, what's the probability that the ball you pick will be red? So most people agree there was three over four. Okay. What's the probability you get a blue ball? One quarter. A more interesting question is what's the probability that the first ball is red and the second ball is also red? And I could have also asked what's the probability that the first ball is red and the second ball is blue? You could have asked any of these questions. And we learned this rule that it's probability of A and B is probability of B given A times probability of A. That was the conditioning rule. And so what I'm doing here is just applying that conditioning rule. The probability that the ball one is red um, and ball two is also red is the probability of ball two being red given that ball one was red times the probability of ball one given red. Now, the capital B is just a symbol. It's a variable symbol. So I could have rewritten this in the following form. The probability of the first ball being red and the second ball being red 
is equal to the probability that the second ball will be red given that the first ball is red times the probability that the first ball is red. Okay? And so that whether I call it B or X or A, it doesn't matter. It's a variable. It's an abstraction of the fact of the the event, the, the phenomenon of choosing a ball. Okay? Most often in we use the variable x just because of tradition. Okay. And sometimes we use say, a different variable to indicate what it is. I used capital B here because these are balls and the balls are red or blue, but I could have used x. Um, we also then asked ourselves the following question. Uh, we, we learned this rule, very important rule, the rule of marginalization that the probability of A is equal to the probability of A and B1 plus the probability of A and B2 plus A, probability of A and B3. Okay? In other words, the probability, or let's do it actually in the case of uh, the red ball. In the case of the red ball, the probability that B2 is red is the sum of the probability of B2 being red and B1 being red plus B2 being red and B1 being blue. Okay? So if you don't know a variable, in this case the variable that we don't know is B1, we need to sum over all its values. Okay? So another way in which we're going to write this is probability of B2 being equal to red is equal to the sum over B1 probability of B2 equal red comma B1. That's one way to write it. Another way to write this that people out there often like to use is that they would say B1 being either red or blue and then they will write P of B2 equal red comma B1 or we could still write this as B1 P of B2 equal red given B1 times the probability of B1. All right, so we have many ways of writing the same thing. Um, in the first, the first time, I just put a B1 to, to indicate that I'm summing over B1. But if I'm summing over B1, that means I'm summing over all the possible values that B1 is taking. That's what the second expression is saying. You're summing over all the values that B1 can take, which are the red or blue. And then the last one, I've just simply applied the conditioning rule that the joint is the conditional times the margin. Okay? And that was essentially how we arrived at this, um, the three quarters answer. We just computed the probability of B2 being red and B1 being red plus, because that's what the sum symbol means, you were adding things, plus the probability of B2 being red and B1 being blue. And if we sum those two, we get what we want, the probability of B2 being red. Okay, so those are the two rules of probability, conditioning and marginalization. And the rest of the class today will be about exercising these rules and getting used to these rules. Another thing we started doing, and this is where we ended in the last class, was in, now I'm instead of calling the balls capital B, I'm going to use the variable X. And instead of saying red, blue, I'm going to use zero and one. This will be more the convention, because often I'm not talking about balls, but often zero, one could be whether the word Viagra appeared or not in my email, 
when I'm building a text classification algorithm to do spam detection. Or it could be 0, 1 to indicate that a patient will die or not die if I give the patient this treatment. And so it's best to just use a single variable x and just use 0, 1 to indicate false or positive. Okay, so having said that, uh, our setup was that with three quarters of probability, the ball is red or zero. From now on, I'm going to use zeros and ones, or that it's one with probability a quarter. And I also have these conditional probabilities. If I initially have a zero ball, if the ball is of color zero, the chances that the next one will be of color one is one third. Okay, so recall, for example, that if you, if you take away one of the red balls, okay, if the first ball was red, you're left with two reds and a blue, so the probability of getting the blue now is one-third, and the probability of getting the red is two-thirds. Okay. So that's what happens when you, when you choose a red. Okay. Oh. That there is nothing I can do about. Um, let's just use this project and hope that if this one fails, I will panic. Okay. So, so the, the thing we did next was how do we put this in matrix notation? And now matrices are just data structures that allow us to um, program more efficiently, and they also allow us to talk about things in a more efficient way. All right, so I essentially entered the numbers, three quarters and one quarter for the probability of x1. Over a single row, note that it adds up to one. Three quarters plus a quarter gives you one. I also added uh, the probability that of going from x1 being zero to x2 being zero, which is this event here. 0 to 0 to thirds. 0 to 1, which would be, in this case, um, 0 to 1 over here. It's 1 third. And then 1 to 0 is 1, and then 1 to 1 is 0. And I'm just filling in that matrix. Now, when I multiply a vector times a matrix, I get a vector. That vector is the probability of x2. So what I've been using is the fact that matrix vector, when you have something of this form, you know, what you're doing is just matrix vector multiplication. Okay. I'll, I'll expand on this point later. Okay, so recall how we do matrix vector multiplication. We take a vector, like 1 and 2, I multiply 1 times 1, and 2 times 3, and that gives me 7. Okay, that's how we do matrix vector multiplication. Now, let's introduce some notation. I'm going to call that, mate, that vector that we had here, I'm going to call this vector pi 1. I'm going to call this matrix G, and I'm going to call this vector Pi 2. Right? Just giving it names. So then I can write, I can summarize that whole equation in this very simple form. And that's what I'm gaining by introducing matrix notation. That instead of writing all these horrendous probabilities, I'm going to just condense this very nicely into three symbols, pi 1, g, and pi 2. Okay, it just gives me a way of abstracting. Pi 1 is of size 1 by 2, g is of size 2 by 2, and pi 2 is size uh, 1 by 2. Now, if I have matrix, in matrix notation, the j, th this means, this symbol means equivalent in my notation. And all we're saying is that the first component of pi 1 gets multiplied times the first 
the entry ij of matrix G to produce the entry j of phi 2. Okay, so that's matrix vector notation. That's how we were introduced matrix vector notation in linear algebra. You essentially take the first component of pi and you multiply it times the first component of G and then you take that same, um, then you take the next component of pi which is 2 and you multiply by the next component of G. Okay? And that gives you pi 2 which is 7. And then you do it again. Okay? So matrix vector notation. Well you probably saw it in this form that if you have a matrix A times a vector X that's the same if you have this then yj is equal to the sum over i of aij times xi. All right, so just two different ways of doing matrix vector multiplication. Now, the rest is just matching symbols because essentially uh, what we're doing is uh, gij is just corresponds to this matrix here and P of X1 is just a vector that corresponds to this vector here. Okay. And then that gives us the other vector which is pi 2. Now what we're saying here is nothing new. We're still doing marginalization and conditioning. The only thing is I'm rewriting this as matrices. And the reason why I rewrite this as matrices is because we're now going to be able to do things that if I didn't have matrices, oh my god, you would spend days and days doing these calculations. If we have matrix, I can quickly answer the question, what's the probability of the th that the third ball will be red? Or the probability that the fourth ball will be red? and so on. So in particular I will be able to keep on multiplying so I can take pi 1 multiply times g, g to produce pi 2. I can then take pi 2 the answer and multiply it times g to produce pi 3. I can take the answer of pi 3 multiply times g to get me pi 4 and so on until say k where k is a very very large number. Now what does this look like based on stuff we did in the tutorials on Monday and this morning? It's the, the Google algorithm. Google algorithm is just doing that, getting red balls and blue balls. Except instead of getting red balls and blue balls, it's getting web pages. And instead of just being red or blue, the web pages could be 20 billion different values. Probably a billion different values. There's a lot of duplicates out there. Um, now, let's assume that after many iterations, pi stops changing. In other words, that pi k minus 1 is equal to pi k, which is equal to pi um, k plus 1, and so on. Uh, we saw that in the tutorials. If we take an arbitrary vector, we multiply it by a stochastic matrix, and we keep multiplying that the answer by the same stochastic matrix, it always converges. And let's say that it converges to a vector pi. Okay. That means that if we take that pi and we multiply it by g one more time, we still get that pi, right? Because if it's not changing anymore, eventually the answer stops changing. You get three quarters and one quarter. If you multiply times g again, you still get three quarters and one quarter. Okay, to those who attended tutorials, I proved this by threatening you with betting $10 this morning, and no one took my bet, so I will take it that everyone believes that this will converge. And whoever doesn't wants to challenge me, the 10 bucks still say it does. Okay, so we can also recall from school this old equation. AX equal lambda X. Now the rest is just pattern matching. X is pi, A is the matrix G, and lambda is equal to 1. 
So what, Google algor what Google's algorithm actually does is it computes the largest eigenvector of a matrix. Yes, they are. Um, I'll say something about it. Let me finish the Google example, and I'll come to that question. So what does Google do? The idea of page rank is that if, if he is very important, many people point to him. Many web pages will point to his web page, that is. And so his rank should be higher than anyone else, because everyone points to him. But let's say that now he also points to me then even though he's the only one that points to me, because he has high rank, I get high rank. Okay? Imagine that no one points to me, but CNN.com has a link to me in their front web page. My web page all of a sudden becomes important. Because a lot of people who are clicking links at random on web pages are likely to eventually click my link. Because a lot of them go to CNN, and once they're in CNN, there is um, if, if they click on all links in CNN with equal probability, then with very high chance they will end up at my web page here at UBC. And that's the idea of page rank. Rank propagates. If important people point to you, you become important. And then rank diminishes. And so it's like that cartoon there, where everyone points to yellow guy. Yellow guy is sort of big and famous and happy. Yellow guy points to red guy. And then red guy gets fame more than um, a lot of the other guys. Say the green guy, for example, that doesn't have an important person pointing um, um, to him or her. OK, so that's the idea of page rank. How does Google implement this? Um, so what Google does is for each web page, so each of these guys are web pages, P1, P2, P3, and so on. For each web page, you check if that page points to the other page. If it does, you put a 1, 0. If it doesn't, you put a, uh, you put a 0. Okay? So th this matrix will have a few 1s, and by far will have zeros. The matrix is of size a billion by a billion, 10 to the 9 by 10 to the 9. It's a vast matrix. You, they, Google, of course, does not create this matrix. This is too large, so just keep it as a sparse representation of the matrix, just basically the locations of the ones. Now, for the Google algorithm to work, um, this matrix has to have the following properties. First, it does not like pages that look like this. Okay? And this is called reducibility. We, don't want, pay, we want, don't want two webs, because that means that if, if a surfer is surfing the three nodes, that surfer will never jump to the other part of the web, because there's no link. The, the two webs are there are separate. Okay, so it's important always to have connections. The graph has to be fully connected. If you can reduce the graph to two subgraphs, then you're in trouble then it doesn't uh, work. Um, so how does Google handle this? So what Google does is Google adds a small number, epsilon, to each entry. Okay. After doing this step, Google goes and normalizes so that each row's sum is equal to 1. Okay. So each row will sum to 1. So in other words, they create a stochastic matrix. They, they create a conditional probability. The probability of going to a web page given that you are in another web page. Okay. So this huge matrix is a conditional probability. 
Epsilon is added for all the values in the matrix. Sorry, I didn't hear. So epsilon is added to all the entries. All the entries. Okay. And then they actually store this for huge matrix. Pardon? And then they actually store this huge matrix because there's now nothing. No, they do it in a smart way because you you have a you know how many entries there are. You know how many ones you have, how many zeros, so you could, com you could do this normalization in a very smart way without forming the matrix, right? Because you know the size of the matrix. And if you know the number of ones, you know the number of zeros, so you know how many times epsilon gets added. So you can do this in a smart way. All the epsilons are the same value, correct? All the epsilons are the same value. And, I don't know, pick a value, 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 9. It will affect the convergence of the algorithm. We, we get to the second eigenvalue question there, but let's leave it for now. Okay, so we add epsilon to make sure that the web gets fully connected. And then we just do, it also has another nice effect, which is it gets rid of possible cycles, which is something that I mentioned in the homework. And in the homework, by the way, you get to implement this. You actually get to go through step by step implement this. And that's how you learn Python, by doing this exercise. In doing so, you will also learn how to implement a search engine. And this is the core technology of a search engine. I have built search engines, I have sold search engines for shit loads of money, and that's how you build them, trust me. Um, now, once you have your page rank, you, the next, once you have this matrix, what you do is you take an initial vector, which is arbitrary, as I've shown you in the tutorials. And that vector is of size 1 by uh, 1 billion, say. And it's arbitrary. It's just all the entries have to sum to 1. Doesn't matter what it is. You could just pick 1 over a billion for each entry. You then multiply that vector times the matrix. And now it's very hard to multiply a matrix times a vector of that size. That's still huge, even in sparse form. So. Who's heard here of MapReduce? Okay. This is why MapReduce was invented. To deal not only with word counts, but to deal with this matrix vector multiplication. So the whole big system stuff that um, is kind of leading the world of computer science, um, cloud computing, so on, was developed to address this problem initially. You multiply a matrix. Mind. It was invented for other things, but it was popularized by Google. Um, you take this matrix times a vector, and you keep doing it many times, and then you converge to a vector. That vector that you converge to in the end, that pi, is the probability of each page. Or, as Google says, the rank of each page. The higher the probability, the higher it will be in your results. So then Google creates an, what's called a reverse index. So for each, for each word, let's say the word cat, there is a key, which is the word. So the word acts as a key. And then you will have a list of the documents and the rank of those documents. And the rank is just pi. So Google extracts the words. So for any word, you know where that, in which document that word occurs, and you know the rank of that document. And so those results, as you see when you search, like the top 10, top 20, those are ranked by pi. Okay. And, and the way it's indexed quickly is because for any key, so this is just basically what in Python we implement as a dictionary, sort of conceptually. Uh, or it's a hash. You have a key, which is the words, and then once you have the words, you can quickly say which are the documents and what's the order, and the results are retrieved to you in seconds. So the probability of, um, let's say you're searching for the word cat, and it gives you this like, 
That's based on how many times the word cat appears on the one page, based on how many other pages are linking to it? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> let me repeat that. So what we do is we first compute the vector pi. And maybe my notation here is not clear. Let me, let me just redo this notation a bit. So we're going to start with a pi naught. We're going to multiply times the matrix G lots of times, say 1,000 times. And that eventually will converge to a vector pi. Okay? That vector pi has 10 to the 9 entries. Okay, let's say that it has 10 to the 9 entries. Now, each entry gives you the importance of each document. So the vector pi tells you the importance of each document. So now I look for all documents where the word cat appears. Okay? So it's just a filtering operation. The documents that only the documents that contain the word cat. And I order those by pi. So it's independent of the query. It's, you only need to compute a page rank once. Of a web page is a function of the number of in degrees in the web graph? That's correct. So, um, like I'm searching for cat, and uh, a certain page has two, a lot of in degrees, but it's not so very relevant for cat. So, should it still have a very high? Tough. Google will give you that page. Uh, what is the semantic meaning of this? There is no semantics here. <laughs> this is how Google works. Okay. Now, this is Google version zero, alpha version. Alpha version, I believe the tale is that the Google guys approached Yahoo, and Yahoo said no when they were selling it for cheap. Um, and then this is still the core. So to build a search engine, you need to build a good crawl, good crawling software. It's usually these days can be done, but that's the expensive part, really. And then the next thing is you need to implement this. This is the core thing. If you just implement this, it actually works pretty well. And it's very, very likely that a word, the page that many people point to that has cat is actually a good page for cat. That's what the algorithm has shown us. But then you do other things. Then you start adding other sort of fudge factors to this index. And the fudge factors could be maybe if it's a Wikipedia page, we increase the weight. Okay, so you probably notice that. Every time you search Wikipedia, somehow up there. And you could add m many fudge factors. You could add, well, people now are interested in social media and Facebook, so let's move those up. And and then you realize that, oh, you could also, like, if, if, if someone gives us money, we could increase their rank. But let's create this extra separate list of results, and let's create a bidding system for them to bid and put their results there. And voila, Google becomes a bunch of billionaires working on computers. Um, essentially, it's a big advertising. That's what Google is. Google is an advertising company. Um, it is a computing company, but, for, but where it makes its money is in advertising. Most of the web is about advertising and consumerism. That's what we're about. Um, so you create that uh, list. Next, you start adding a lot of fudge factors that make the results much better. So recently, there was a scandal with Microsoft uh, got in trouble because they were actually what they were doing is when people were doing a search in Microsoft, they would make it a search in Google, they would get the results, and then they, they basically were training their system to learn all the fudge factors that Google has. <laughs> and Google caught them, uh, and that was quite scandalous. 
Um, but this is it. This is all you need to build a search engine. And when you do your homework, by the end of it, you will have built a search engine. Make sure that you understand the concepts of reducibility. Make sure that you understand why periodicity is a problem. And make sure that you understand this algorithm. Because it will be examinable in midterm one. Um, I'll go further to say that it will actually be in the midterm. So, because everyone in this class ought to know how Google works. <laughs> we use it a lot. So if we, uh, something that we use so much and that affects our lives so much, it would be reckless not to know what that thing is. How do they, uh, oh, uh, I had to, ask, to answer another question, but yeah. go ahead. Ta da! All of us. We give them feedback all the time. And when we personalize, we give them even more feedback. If we Google Plus, more feedback. <laughs> We're helping them a lot. Okay, so I haven't gone into that in personalization. To understand Google Plus and so on, we need to learn a few more things in this course. So, another 10 lectures or so. Now, the thing that I want to do next, though, is go into Bayes' rule. Um, I haven't answered your question, and I will be very brief without trying to uh, get in distracted. The second eigenvalue will give you the rate of convergence of the algorithm. I will post something about it in the news group. OK, Bayes' rule. <coughs> Okay. What I intend with this lecture is that you learn base rule and that you learn to apply base rule. And base rule is nothing but a consequence of marginalization and conditioning, so this gives you a chance to also practice marginalization and conditioning. We'll look at base rule with three examples. <coughs> Example one, your doctor has good news and bad news. The bad news is that you've tested positive for, I don't know, HIV. The tests are 99% accurate. Okay? So this is quite serious. You like ask your doctor, so what's the chance that it's wrong? 0.01. But then the doctor tells you the good news. But only one in 10,000 people have this disease. Now my question to you is, should you be worried or not? How many people would be really worried? <laughs> uh, half of the class. How many people would be, nah, that's OK. <laughs> About five, five people. And so. I would say then that we'll do, let's record this so that we remember. So the unhappy ones is about 50 people, and the ones that would be happy, it's about five people. Okay? They might be worried, they're just good sports. Now, this problem arises in courts of law, okay? Because Someone is found guilty. You know, some test, some test was conducted in court. There is a probability of that test, the DNA test, indicating that the person is guilty, that is their DNA, or that some sort of evidence correlates to them. What's the probability that they're guilty? Here's a good example of this, which is cycling and drug taking. What's the probability that a cyclist, you do, the cyclist does the test, which is 99% accurate. The cyclist is found to have taken, um, God knows, heroin to go up the mountains faster. What's the probability that the cyclist did indeed take heroin? I think it's other drugs that they take, but. <laughs> okay. Here's a second example. This one's fun. You're, there's a competition, and behind two doors, there's goats, 
behind one door, there's an amazing prize, you know, a brand new, um, I don't know, Ferrari. Unless you really like goats, you probably would rather want to have the Ferrari. <laughs> um, or if you don't like Ferraris, imagine that it's, I don't know, like the latest, the iPhone 5. <laughs> <laughs> now you choose one door. Let's say you choose door, um, like this guy's choosing door three. The guy opens door one and says, would you like to change to door two? The question then is, should you change? Yes. Okay. So let's, actually my drawing doesn't match my number, sorry about that. So let's say you open door one, I open door three, and there's only a goat there, and then I give you the choice to switch to stick with door one. How many people would stick with door one? One, two, three, door one, four, five, six, any more, door one, door one, door one gone for six. Switch to door two. I see about 50 people. It really doesn't matter whether you stick with door one or switch to door two. How many people would endorse that view? One, two, three, four. Okay? This time you're right. You were wrong the previous time, but, <laughs> and we'll see why. So this problem does affect us in real life. This problem affected Bart Simpson, who in this case had to find, in this case, instead of a war, it rewards, there were threats. And sadly, he found the threat behind the door. <laughs> so in real life, this matters. Mm -hmm. Or in a recent movie, this problem was also posed to the student class. The students attentively listen how to solve this problem and use their knowledge of probability to um, go to Vegas and make <laughs> lots of money. <laughs> if you do not go to Vegas, you can just go and you know, sit down on Robson and you can use three cards and you can try the same trick and you'll make quite a bit of money out of tourists. Okay, problem number three. Can a, if, you type, if I type a word in my computer, do you think that computer, suppose that I type the word cat, do you think the computer is capable of saying cat? Okay, how many people think it is capable of saying the word cat? Okay, really participate in the class, don't put your hands. How many people think that computer is incapable of saying cat? Pardon? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But let's see. Most computers, uh, oh, it would say it with a funny accent, cat or whatever. But it would say, or you will have like a robot voice, cat, or the sexy voice that they usually get. But it would say cat. So I, I, I would like to think that 100% of the class believes that a computer, when you type words in it, can generate a sound. So computers are capable of doing that. Every computer, every computer you have can do that. Just download it. But now, can computers do the opposite, the reverse thing? Given a sound, they will always tell you which words it is. Yeah? How many people think yeah? Always. 99.9%, .9%, not always, but 99.9%. .9%. You guys have great faith in Siri. <laughs> it's probably 98% or whatever. But they, they're capable, but they don't get it quite there. Siri is the example. So if, if you have an iPhone and you play with Siri, you'll find that it's very frustrating. I just bought this one two, days, two weeks ago, and I realized the five has just come out. It's like so frustrating. <laughs> So frustrating. I picked the wrong door. All right, so I will say three people. Why? If it's so easy to go from words to sounds, why is it so hard to go from sounds to words? Because there is many ways of making sounds that point to one word. That's correct. 
The problem is not one is not one to one. Okay. Enter base rule. Base rule will allow us to solve all of these problems. Base rule is the rule of thinking. It's the rule to invert to reverse statements about probabilities. If you know the probability of some B given A, if you know the probability of a sound given a word, you're able to compute the probability of a word given a sound. And the same applies to vision, the same applies to anything. It follows from the following principles. P of A and B is equal to P of a, sorry, let's do P of B given A times P of A. But we also, in the last class, said that this is the same as P of A given B times P of B. Right? And so because these two guys are equal, then P of B given A times P of A is equal to P of A given B times P of B, and so the statement follows. Okay, so it's very easy to derive Bayes' rule. Often, this is also written as P of B given A times P of A, and then you have a normalization here, and then we write P of B given A times P of A. Okay? Note that the two are equivalent because P of B given A times P of A is just P of A and B by the law of conditioning. And then by the law of marginalization, if you sum B, you get back, sorry, if you sum A, you get back B. Okay? The other thing to notice is that what's inside the sum is nothing but just the denominator of, it's just the sum of the numerator of what's on top. So you're just basically normalizing so it adds up to 1 over b. Okay? Because we know that the sum over b of the probability of b given a must be equal to 1. Okay? Because a is given. There's no uncertainty over a. And if you sum a probability, probabilities must sum to 1. Okay? And you're summing over b. So before we learned it like this, if you sum of all the values of B, you get 1. The same is true when you condition. If A means Africa or Asia, the law of probability still applies. Okay, where it's going to be useful is that typically the way it gets applied in cognitive science and in the study of mind is that we assume that individuals have hypotheses in their heads. Like here, let's say that a child has the hypothesis of what is a sheep. Okay, the higher that red curve, more likely that something is a sheep. Then the child observes um, a sheep, and then the parents tell the, the child that is a sheep. Okay, no, Jimmy, that's not a dog, that's a sheep. And so the child gets another probability that's called the likelihood. Okay. Prior likelihood. Then the child multiplies those two and then normalizes so that that new thing sums to what? And that's called the posterior. Okay. This is Bayesian inference. You start with some knowledge about the world you make new observations, and you use Bayes' rule to revise your knowledge. Okay. Later we will use graphs to describe this pro We will use graphs to describe this process. Now let me quickly do this one, and then I'll let you guys go. If the probability that you were the, of the test being accurate is 0.99, that is, the probability of T1 given D1 is 0.99, and P T0 given D0 is also 0.99. And assuming that the probability that this is, is 1 in 10,000, in order to know whether you have the disease, the calculation you need to do is 
do Bayes' rule. P of D equal 1 given T equal 1. Given that the test was positive, what's the probability that you have the disease? And that's equal to P of T equal 1 given D equal 1 times P of D equal 1. Okay, we just, I'm just doing Bayes' rule. And then I need to sum over P of T equal 1 given D equals 0, P of D equals 0, and then P of plus P of T equal 1 given D equal 1 times P of T equal 1. Okay, so I'm just doing the sum one term at a time. Okay, for Friday, I want the answer to this calculation. Okay, that's your homework assignment. Just plug in the probabilities and so that you can all see how wrong you were in having, there was no need to be worried, as you'll find out.